Excellent. Uh, hi, I'm Karen Cardarelli, Executive Director of FACETS. Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome to FACETS. Welcome back for this critical conversation that we're going to have today. And um, uh, I just am extraordinarily proud to present this group of people to you and to hear what you all have to say. Uh, so I want to quickly just jump right into it and welcome our moderator today, the incomparable Jessica Steinrock. Um, Jessica's credits are incredible and uh, let me just run them down real quick. You, you can just turn the other way. You don't have to listen. <laughs> Jessica, um, her intimacy coordination credits include Yellow Jackets with Showtime, Never Have I Ever with Netflix, Little Fires Everywhere. She's recently been profiled in the New York Times and says she came to intimacy work by way of improv comedy, which I love, um, and has developed techniques and methods for promoting consent. And uh, remarkably in 2020, along with director Marie Percy, founded Intimacy Directors and Coordinators, which is known nationally, by the way. Um, it was we, in talking to the filmmakers of Body Parts that they led me to Intimacy Directors and Coordinators and ultimately to Jessica. So um, really uh, grown quickly, I imagine. Um, and if all those credits weren't enough, she also holds a PhD in theater from uh, from U of I Urbana Champagne, Urbana Champagne. So help me welcome Jessica. Well, thank you, thank you all. Yes, I can look this direction now. <laughs> Ugh, always a little awkward. Um, well, hi folks, welcome. It's so good to see you all. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, I hope a lot of you got to see um, the, the incredible documentary. And if you didn't get to see it, I hope you're staying after to see it because it is truly amazing. Um, yes, as Karen said, I am Dr. Jessica Steinrock. I am an intimacy coordinator as well as an intimacy director for theater and live performance as well as the CEO of IDC. Um, and today I am lucky enough to be the panel moderator for these three incredible intimacy professionals who will get a chance to introduce themselves very soon. But I can assure you, these are the professionals who are pioneering intimacy work here in Chicago. Um, and frankly, because it's so new, they are pioneering intimacy work nationally as well. I mean, yes, we can clap for that. Amazing. Um, for those of you who were here for the movie, we got to see how in the last five years, intimacy coordination has kind of grown from this really niche vocation to what is now really quite present in entertainment vernacular across many different industries. And this has happened again, as we saw on the backdrop of a viral Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein public trials. And we are here planted in this cultural moment that has given significantly more attention to this role and its capacity to create safer spaces for actors and by way of that, better performances overall for scenes of intimacy. On this panel today, um, we're gonna dig a lot deeper into intimacy work and also address this growing need as this new profession is here to crystallize at least a semi-standard understanding of the scope of practice of this role, its terminology, and how this role is implemented into the creative process as seamlessly as possible. Um, again, each of these panelists here is on the front lines of this work, helping to define and pioneer this role to bring entertainment industry into a more consent-forward future. So for the next hour, which is not a lot of time, folks, to cover the broad, uh, broadness of this industry, um, we're going to talk about all of the different facets uh, that we possibly <laughs> Thank you! I'll be here all night. At least for the next hour. Um, we're going to be talking about all of the many facets of this work. And there will also be some Q&A, so as you're listening, if there's different questions that come up, please feel free to write down your questions. We will open it up to you all to ask our amazing panelists your thoughts. So without further ado, I'm going to ask the panelists themselves to introduce, um, to introduce themselves, because I've talked enough. Um, and so we're going to get started. Are you ready? Thank you. You are a small but mighty crowd, and I'm digging it. Um, uh, Greg, why don't we start with you? If you can give us just a, a short intro, who you are, what you do. 
Is this gonna feedback on me? Nice. Okay. Uh, next. Um, hello, all. My name is Greg Jeffroy. I use he/him pronouns. Uh, I am uh, an intimacy professional here in Chicago. Uh, I have been uh, working as an artist profession in Chicago for the last ten. Oh my God, eleven years. <laughs> there it is. Yes, there it is. Um, um, just uh, what I do, um, I'm, um, I'm a visiting professor at Columbia College Chicago teaching uh, acting and intimacy. Um, I am a uh, co-resident intimacy consultant at Steppenwolf Theater, um, and I am associate faculty with theatrical intimacy education. Um, yeah, want to keep it short. That's what I got. And grateful to be here. Thank you. May the ball jump up. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Sarah, what you got for us? I gave you my sentences, I remember. Um, my <laughs> name is Sarah Scanlon. I use she, her pronouns or anything respectful. Um, I am also an intimacy coordinator and director and multidisciplinary actor here in Chicago. Um, I have an MFA in acting from the Moscow Art Theater and the American Repertory Theater. And uh, what else? I'm currently uh, the intimacy coordinator for The Shy, season six, which is going wonderfully. Um, I've worked at uh, all of the major universities as a guest lecturer in Chicago, as well as a couple of in Indiana universities, Notre Dame. Um, choreographed a couple of shows with DePaul and Northwestern and Northeastern University. Um, and this last year, I was mostly with Chicago Shakespeare Theater as their uh, intimacy director for a couple different shows going on there. And uh, I also have a background in uh, aerial dance and aerial coaching. And uh, I think that was kind of a, a, a big way of sort of getting, getting in to the, to the movement part of, of, all of, this, of all of this work. So, thrilled to be here. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, hey, ever Nope. This is my phone. It's a firm press. <laughs> Hello, okay, great. We are alive. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Imi Tin. My pronouns are she and they. I am an intimacy coordinator, producer, and multidisciplinary artist based here in Chicago. You can find out more about me on the interwebs, but um, I'd like to say that my work centers on narrative plenitude. I think we should be telling more stories about more groups of people in more ways, especially the people we haven't heard from. And that's a lot of why I'm in intimacy, that's a lot of why I'm in art, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Okay, yeah. Again, as I said, complete rock star panel. I'm so excited. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna start with you first. And I want to talk a little bit more about this term intimacy that's relatively broad. And as someone who's working um, on a full series of a show, how do you define intimacy? How have you worked with your production to define intimacy and say when you're needed and when you're not needed? Yeah, so uh, intimacy for me is any moment of simulated sex, nudity, or uh, heightened sensitivity. Uh, for either physical or even sometimes emotional uh, interaction between two characters. Uh, whenever there is a minor involved in any of these, I am always there, even if it's just a peck on the cheek, um, just to make sure that they feel comfortable. I always check in with their parents. Uh, those are always really great conversations. But I think it's, um, I know that The Shy did not, actually The Shy started before intimacy coordinating was a thing. So they didn't always have intimacy coordinators. So as soon as intimacy coordinators came about, the scenes could get steamier and we could deal with more nudity because we had things like writers and we could talk to the actors about what they felt comfortable with as opposed to like saying, oh, maybe, and oh, I don't know, you know? So I think for me, intimacy is uh, any sort of interaction. Also, this is for the director too. So a lot of the times the director will, the script will say, uh, they have angry sex. And you're like, what does that mean? Um, and so the director goes, I don't know what that means. So, you know, so the director and I discuss, what does that look like? Like, what do you want to see? Um, and then we talk to the actors. Hey, here's what the director wants to see. So it's making things really specific in the realm of those uh, you know, simulated sex scenes, making sure any of the nudity is, again, covered in a rider, um, which is a legal document that you sign saying what you will and will not do on camera. Um, and uh, yeah, 
Does that answer your question? That absolutely answers okay. my question. Thank you Great. so much. Um, Greg, I kind of want to pass this question to you as well as someone who works a lot in theater. Um, again, this definition of intimacy, which is such a broad word, and yet also we're talking about uh, simulated sex, nudity, but how, how does how does your definitions for intimacy uh, and your work in theater compare or contrast with other definitions you might hear? Um, the definition, uh, thank you, uh, great question. It is, um, the definition that I primarily use is the, is the one, the extended definition uh, that was uh, penned by Ann James, founder of Intimacy Choreographers of Color, uh, Bliss Griffin, uh, Laura Reichert, and Chelsea Pace, which is if any part of your intersecting identity. Uh, you can think of it like the protected identity, so race, uh, race, sex, gender, religion. If any of those are being leveraged in the story that is being told, then it is very likely that a personal part of yourself is being asked to be part of the story. And since I'm thinking about theater and the idea of sustainability, i.e. like the eight show week, um, it is a matter of how exactly do we proactively create a type of environment that allows you to find what your yes is and be able to navigate what that discomfort is because your characters are living in discomfort. So it's, I, I don't primarily focus on the idea of safety being that it is subjective, but what is sustainable? What is the thing that works? Um, and so I find that that is what my primary approach is when it comes to the work of this like, what is the thing that you can continuously say yes to and come back to, mm. even though it's not the most joyous thing for you mm. to do, but it is part of the story that is being told and to think about the humans that before the process, in the process, but more importantly being that a lot of, I mean, theater folks are like contract workers, what happens to the people after yeah. the process? That's so good. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, perfect. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit more um, about the process by which you all are, are uh, doing this work. So, Aimee, um, when you get a script and you've determined that whatever the thing is that you're looking at is intimacy, what, what do you do as an intimacy coordinator to prepare for the scene? What questions are you asking of yourself, of the script, of other, par of other participants in that process? Great question, because I think that part is really mystifying for many people. Um, well, first, I I am a lover of Excel spreadsheets. I am a lover of color coding. So I am breaking down that script um, and looking at all the things that may. We all know. We all love a good Excel spreadsheet. Um, but that's thinking about how my work is going to intersect with other departments. Of course, it's intersecting with the actors and the director, but it's also touching on wardrobe. It's touching on hair and makeup. Is there a stunt involved in this? Is a camera shot or location going to determine how we're actually able to physically do these actions? And then I think intimacy or nudity or any, any of these hyper-exposed moments have to be rooted in character and story. So for me, that comes back, that might be going back to the writer and being like, what? For example, I have a scene that I'm looking at right now that said, and then they fuck. And that's the scene. That is the entire <laughs> scene. And I'm like, OK. Um, I've read the stuff before the scene, so I know these characters' relationships, but sex looks different at different times with different people. Like, what, what do you want the audience to come away with? Okay, what are the actors physically capable and or comfortable doing? And then what is camera looking for? What is director looking for? What is the visual story we want to tell? And the beauty of intimacy coordination and intimacy direction is that we're combining so many different modes of storytelling together. Um, and film and theater are collaborative processes. Yeah. These are team sports. You're not going to do it without everyone in the room working towards a unified vision. And you can tell when there wasn't that unified vision. You can tell when someone wasn't talking with someone. So a lot of that prep work is getting all those conversations out of the way. So when we actually go to do the work, it's easy. We're adjusting bodies. We're fixing small things. But it's a smooth day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing, what was this? 
this thing on? There it is. <laughs> Firm press. Um, okay, well, so I'm seeing some head nods from you both as well, um, which, you know, again, as, as things come up or thoughts come up, please feel free to interject. Um, but Sarah, I'm hoping maybe you can also talk a little bit more about where you've seen the role of the intimacy coordinator specifically support that larger creative process. It's a brand new role. It's something that a lot of folks have had 30, 40 year careers without ever having interacted with someone in this position. Um, so in your time implementing this role, educating folks about what it means to be this role. Howard, we'll get there. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. No, I see. Um, there it goes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, how are you seeing the role of the intimacy coordinator support that full creative process? Yeah, so uh, everyone, sort of like Amy just said, like everyone being on the same page, you'd think that that was always a thing. It's not always been a thing. It sometimes still is not a thing. Um, but one of, the, one of the wonderful things is it's um, this interdepartmental communication. So what are we talking to the costume department about? What are we talking to the makeup and hair department about? If we have a writer that says that the actress is not going to be showing her uh, chest, but the director wants to see maybe the side, and she says yes to that, hey, can we get her hair to go down the front so we can hide that? So there's a lot of really interesting meetings we can have interdepartmentally with all of the departments to say, hey, here's what the director's vision is. How can we all support that director's vision? And also, how can we do it in a way that is not um, confusing or people getting multiple sort of having to go back and forth a bunch of different times? Because once you're on the day, is controlled chaos in the best way, but if it's if it's if it's we want controlled chaos. We don't want actual chaos. So. Um, but you know, you, you get to talk to the director, you get to make sure they know that you are there to support their vision. You aren't there to take their job, you aren't there to do the work for them, um, you're not there to uh, you know, mess with the actor's process. You know, for me, I love making sure that the actor knows that I'm there to advocate for them, but to make sure, um, like you said, with characters, it's really important that the actor is doing something that makes sense for their character. So when we're having discussions about all of these things, we can uh, have discussions with the director, then I can talk to the actors, then I can say back to the director, hey, here's what the actors feel good, full, you know, full body yeses and doing. Then we talk to costumes and say, hey, we need this, that, and the other. Then we talk to the DP, uh, director of photography, saying, hey, we need to hide this, this, and that. Can we make sure we have plants on set tomorrow? You know, and so it's like, you know, we have all sorts of things that, you know, it's the, I feel very much like I can, uh, sort of hold that and making sure that that scene has everything it needs so that because it's even people who have done tons of scenes of intimacy, it's nerve wracking. It is nerve wracking. Like it's just crazy. Like, you know, like um, when you're in a room and it's essential personnel only on a closed set, that's still like 20 people, you know? And so, you know, you wanna make sure that the camera people know what's going on, especially if you're doing a scene that's sensitive or, you know, simulated assault or something. Um, you talk to the camera people too. You talk to the boom operator. You say, hey, just so you know, here's what the scene is about. And we want you to feel safe too. Um, I had the script supervisor text me the other day during a scene that they were doing that was actually a scene of violence that I was not there for because it wasn't intimacy. But she said, I really wish you were, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get emotional. She's like, I really wish you were here today. I didn't realize how hard it was going to be to watch this scene. And so I was able to like text her back and give her some tools to get through that day. Um, and so I'm always really, I'm just really honored to be able to hold that for the entire production. Um, and it's not just for the actors sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, great. Yes, uh, I just wanna uplift two things that you've, uh, that you've shared, and thank you for sharing that. Um, one, it tends to be, the focus tends to primarily be on the performers, but what we, what I think this practice can be and what it, uh, at its best, is understanding that you also have people in the room who you're asking to witness. Yes like repeatedly witness. 
And so how exactly are we cultivating an environment that is in consideration for all the people that are there? Yes, making sure that the person that is, um, that their, you know, their NIL, their, their name, image, likeness is being captured in this moment. Make sure that they have the tools that they need in order to navigate this moment. But what happens to the full room? Like that energetically, like how does that affect the room and how exactly do we engage in those conversations? Which leads to my second thing that I want to uplift is, notice, these conversations are happening before we do the thing. <laughs> the, <clears throat> the fact is that which drives what it is that we do, this thing called art that we do, is urgency. It is literally the thing that has infused itself into the language, you know, the show must go on, the yes and, like, uh, very much in the, uh, in the movie, it's just like, um, yeah, we're at this place, uh, we're gonna do this thing, and let's go. It is this idea of just like, we have to move, and what that does is working from that reactive place, what it actually ultimately does is it leaves us with less options. Mm -hmm. If we're having a conversation before anything happens, then we have all the options. Right. We're just like, we can talk about this, we can talk about this possibility, we can prepare ourselves. And so the, the individual for me in theater, the individual that I always turn to and kind of go, they figured it out, stage managers. Yeah. <laughs> it is the individual who has a kit that they prepare in order to meet the challenge of the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what we are doing. We are individuals who are equipped with tools, hopefully will give you the tools that work for you, but ultimately it's just making sure that you know that you have options and there's more than one way of working and more importantly, there's the way that is sustainable for you to work, ultimately. Can I say some, one more thing, uplifting some of that too? Thank you, but beautiful. Um, I'm finding that the more we're uh, bringing this process and coordinating and directing to theaters and sets, the more people are understanding the pace at which we need to work and that we work at the speed of trust and we can't just jump in if someone's not ready. Um, time is money, but if you can't get a good performance, that doesn't matter. You're gonna spend more money, you're gonna be there longer. Um, and so something that I've really loved working on a sh The Shy now for the second year is that they understand that we have to slow down a little bit and the actors might want photos of the monitor and we might need to fix the hair a little bit more and we might need to tape them into their costumes for a little bit longer but then we get it in five takes or less. Mm -hmm. So we don't have them doing it over and over and over and over because it's exhausting. So I wanna see three takes, kill it, and get out. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my goal too, I love that, thank you. I mean, I wanna pull you in here too as you have experience on both sides of the table as producer and as intimacy coordinator. Any other insights you want to share about here? Well, I'll give you this microphone and then, <laughs> and then I'm just gonna project. Um, <laughs> uh, but any insights you wanna share from that producer's role? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question, Jessica, because I do think it influences how I move as an intimacy coordinator is coming from a production background. I understand the urgency that exists on set, and I really want to lift what both of you said. We don't have to, film is hurry up and wait. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. well, suddenly there's all this pressure to do this thing, and then we're all sitting there being like, well, that light doesn't quite look right. right. <laughs> Can I go five points? No, three. No, no, five. Um, and those conversations, <laughs> it's always five. It's always five. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we, as a producer, there's so many power dynamics we also have to be aware of. In the room, actors are trained to say yes. Uh -huh. Actors are trained to say yes. You are, as a second, as a third on set, as a PA, you are trained to say yes to your superior. Yep. And there's a lot of reasons we have hierarchy on set, and the reality is we cannot append hierarchy in one day. Um, there's also union reasons there are hierarchies on set that we have to acknowledge and honor as well. Um, so learning how to exist within these power dynamics and acknowledge them and name them so that we can be like, producer, you have a lot of power in this situation. You are the person signing the checks. When you say you want something, the director is listening. The DP is listening. The whole team is listening. They may not agree, but they're keeping really in mind that you control the money or they're keeping in mind that you control the distribution. When a director tells a green actor to do something, some actors are so happy just to be there. 
that they will, we, we saw that in this documentary just now, or you'll see it later when you watch it. Um, so being aware of the power and how you hold space is important no matter what position you're in. A PA has just as much ability to affect the energy of a set as a producer. If anything, a PA has more because the PA is seen by everyone, the producer is seen by like five people sometimes. So being aware of how we move in space and how it is our job as a whole crew, as a whole cast, to take care of one another, to honor everyone's boundaries, to acknowledge that boundaries are a gift, mm -hmm. and that we are all coming from different positions that we exist in, outside of our lives, of the bodies we're in, of the our gender presentation, of our skin color. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you have to think about those things every second of the day, but I am going to tell you that people in historically excluded groups probably are thinking that about that a lot more than you may realize. Mm -hmm. You have to know what weight your words carry, what weight your actions carry, and proceed appropriately. Yes. Also don't patronize people. I do see sometimes there's like a tendency to assume that we have to protect, especially female actors, because they've been so harmed historically. But also people have agency. Yes. Honor everyone's agency. Honor everyone's ability to live up to the moment mm. as well. So good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking about power, because it is, um, specifically thinking about theater, it is the, I speak often about the, unfor unfortunately, the, the invisibilizing of power, um, the, cre the, the attempt to create the illusion of a flat hierarchy. Um, specifically, this happens a lot with theater and like the ensemble and like moving at the speed of trust. It is like, hey, we have three weeks to rehearse this thing. We're in tech for a week and we're going. And so sometimes I think something that happens that inadvertently has a negative effect is this idea of when we're here, and I tell my students and everybody this all the time, if any institution tells you this, run, run, please run. If anybody in any institution comes to you and says, we are a family, if you hear this, why is this an issue? This is, I understand what is, what, is, uh, what is attempted to be done there. It is this idea of like, we want to welcome you into the space. We want you to feel comfortable in this space as you're navigating as you are here. I think the unfortunate byproduct of that is you've created this idea that how we affect the space is equal. How our decision making, the setting of expectations, it is not equal. I need you to know, I, I have said this to a theater before, it's like, we are a family. And I was like, you're a 501c3. Yeah. This is a business. I am a contracted person. You have expectations of me. I will meet those expectations. But let's be very clear about this, because if I don't meet those expectations, you will be disappointed. And so how can we make sure that we are acknowledging that, yes, power exists. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is. But being able to acknowledge that allows us to be honest and transparent in the room and being able to actually move forward with clarity about who's supposed to do what, when, and such, so then we don't get into that space of urgency because it's like, you know, like that Spider-Man gif is like, yeah. right? <laughs> so how exactly do we acknowledge that, be in a space where we're, where we're comfortable with that? Because like, it's there, and it's supposed to be there, right. so. Um, can I just think about agency? Yeah. Um, uh, no, that's great. Um, this, this idea about agency is so in, so fascinating to me because what I'm experiencing as well, because this is such a new position and people are, they don't want to mess up. They don't want to call, they don't want to offend anyone. They don't want to hurt anyone. And so what I like to tell, especially, it's really funny. I have to tell the, the young, not the kids, the, the younger students and the, the older, you know, old timers is that just as much uh, respecting someone's yes is, uh, is just as important as respecting their no. So if someone gives you an enthusiastic yes to something, you don't have to say, oh, are you sure? Oh, oh are you sure? Wait, uh, wait, are you sure? Because then the person who gave the yes, again, I'm speaking from my own experience, starts to question, oh, is, is this okay? Or oh, are are you okay doing this? You know, and so it's it's really it, it's really when when the refrain has been, oh, I'm cool with whatever she wants to do. I'm cool with whatever she's cool with. I'm like, okay, what are you cool with? <laughs> you know, um, and and I want to know what you're cool with. Um, and so so that when I go to your scene partner, I can say, hey, 
here's what your scene partner is comfortable with. How do you feel about this, that, and the other? You know, and so, so it, also, they, I think this position opens up an opportunity to make sure that people know that there's someone here to support them and they're not gonna screw up because we are giving them vocabulary in the room, how to ask for consent, how to ask for boundaries. And if they do screw up, we can talk about it. And there isn't like shame around it, Correct. which I think is really important too. Because when people feel safe, they're willing to take bigger risks. And that's how we get more exciting performances. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and y'all can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. In the back? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, and so we're talking about like intimacy in production, and a lot of the things we saw in this uh, film were talking about larger um, productions. We had some scenes from Sex Life, from Vita. Um, I, in particular, I want to throw this question to you. What does it look like? What does the role of the intimacy coordinator look like, and how does it differ on different sizes of production, from student films all the way through some of Hollywood's biggest movies and television show? How does that role shift and change? That's a great question because it is very different. Um, I'll start with student films. What I'm noticing in student films, one, the crew is much smaller. We talked about like who's there, uh, who's essential personnel on a set. That's 20 people on a film set. That's like four people on a student film set. It might be you and the director, honestly. Um, but I see this like desire in young people, which really excites me to really embrace consent sets. Like sometimes they're bringing scenes to me where I'm like, you don't need me. Like you don't, you don't need me here. I mean, I'm happy to be here to support you in this process and help you learn, but like you don't, it's, it's fine. They're holding hands guys. <laughs> but there, I think there's this moment where um, I see a lot of young and emerging filmmakers trying to change some of set hi hierarchy and like set norms. A lot of that has been very patriarchal. A lot of that is like very male dominant energy where sometimes I'm like, just whip out a ruler. It'll be so much faster and we can just move on with our day and get the day done. Mm -hmm. um, with so many of the men that we deal with on set um, and with young people and like sets that are increasingly black and brown, sets that are increasingly gender diverse, we're seeing a lot more efforts to not just keep actors safe, but keep crews safe. So that's really exciting. But Le smaller sets means less money, means less formality, sometimes also means less awareness of things they should be thinking about. So you may be in the position, if you're working on a set with green folks, to do a little more educating and to take a little more care. It's also been really interesting. I get so much more rehearsal time on an indie <laughs> film. Like, I get hours, and I'm like, what is this theater? <laughs> You're not telling me to like, get done in like 20 minutes or five. Um, and the pace of a, a studio system, like that is a fully union regulated set. There are rules. You cannot be as helpful in the same way. I position it as stay in your own lane, but know when to be proactive and know when to offer a solution. Mm -hmm. I am not touching that prop because someone from 476 is going to yell at me if I touch that prop. But... If they have thought, if they want my thought on how that prop can be moved to better mask this actor, I am happy to offer that information and then watch them move it. Um, and I think there, there's just more layers of bureaucracy to deal with, more layers of power. You might be talking to producers, EPs, showrunners who are coming from different generations and may have different feelings about your position. You also, I think, because our industry is new, there's, we're figuring out best practices still. And you're going to run into situations, and I think this often happens at the studio level, where you're perhaps cleaning up the mess of a previous intimacy coordinator who either maybe didn't energetically get along with folks or actively caused problems. Or they're coming in with this assumption that we are police. We yeah. are babysitters. We are therapists. We are HR. And we are none of those things. That is not my job. My job here is to make this intimate scene work, to make sure everyone's feeling advocated for, and that's what I'm doing. I'm not here to be a hall monitor. Mm -hmm. um, and when and working against that assumption happens a lot more on bigger sets. I would say it also varies network to network. There's networks that have deeply embraced having intimacy coordinators and make that a mandate so their folks are more trained, they're doing more sexual harassment and consent trainings prior to me even being hired. Um, 
but there are, there are layers, and again, coming back to power, there's different chains of command that you have to be extremely aware of as your career escalates as an intimacy coordinator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about the size of production from small to large, we can also think about how intimacy work is infiltrating a large number of entertainment disciplines. I mean, already we've talked about theater and TV and film, um, but Greg, I'm going to toss this one to you as you have work in opera and fashion and, I mean, so many other multidisciplinary practices. Where are you seeing the foundations of intimacy as applicable beyond maybe even scenes of intimacy and beyond strictly theater and TV and film? <laughs> um, um, so I, I'm, I'm being brought in a lot from to do uh, intimacy consulting work, um, uh, specifically focus more on like po uh, for institutions like policy and such. Like what are the like uh, going back to it? Like how can we be as proactive as possible? I think what is starting to happen specifically in other institutions like opera and fashion, they're realizing that the day of the the day that we are doing the thing is not the day when we start determining how we're going to work. It is way, like, before we, the show is already very much alive. I'll, t I'll talk about for theater for a second. Um, the show is very much alive and lives with the designers and everybody who's been working on it for the last eight months. The actors just happen to be the last people in the room. So, like, this show, like, for some people, it's like, I've been working on the show for eight months. Like, for, uh, with operas, it's like, we, we programmed this show three years ago. And you think I'm exaggerating. I propose to let you know, three years ago, we thought about doing this show. And yet, sometimes, I don't get called in until, like, two weeks before rehearsal start. Right? It is a matter of, like, um, so the conversations that I've been having is, like, how can we exactly put things into policy and, more importantly, into practice? before we even begin doing the thing because that which is happening before we get into the room has a profound effect about what happens in the room. Like I define culture as like what is given what is given space in the room to grow. Like the moment something starts, you know, it's just like, oh this starts growing. If we go, mm, nope, not in here, then that doesn't become part of the culture. Mm. But the moment you go, okay, that's mm, I don't really like that, but that can stay then that becomes woven into yeah. um, the fabric of your culture. And so the conversation that I've been having with fashion is like understanding what are the parameters of like how exactly we work and can we actually bring these tools in um, specifically in the place before the, um, the models are on set. So um, what is uh, what can go into like a writer? What can the conversations be? Like what is uh, who is the person that's setting expectation? Who's going to meet the person once they get there? Because um, what I was finding in having conversations um, with these individuals, uh, specifically I was uh, having conversations with Models Trust, it was like, what are the things that we can do to help when we, when we can't be there? Agents were talking about like, I, I don't know how exactly I can make sure to look out for this model when they're on set, because I literally cannot be there. So what are the questions that I need to be asking, understanding that this industry works in a very specific way? Um, with opera, that has a two-week rehearsal process, I wish I was joking, um, it is um, what's helpful specifically in opera is they understand what sustainability looks like because they never perform two shows in a day and they do not perform consecutive days. It is, we perform on Wednesday, we perform on Friday. So there's never, so they understand what rest, they understand what all those mean. So it is, for me, it is highlighting like, this is already how you're working. Because um, I think some of the fear, specifically when we come into the room, is just like, you're gonna ask me to change everything, everything that I've known, especially for folks who are just like, I've been in this industry for 30 plus years, and I feel like you're asking me to throw everything away. It's like, no, we're just leaning into the things that are actually working, and not just for a select amount of people, but actually works for the people who come in and out of your institution. And so lean into the things that are working and being able to highlight the things that aren't working and ask the question of why they aren't working. So um, a lot of times I'm just being brought into like, start asking questions and being like, okay, this thing, how's it working for you? This thing, like, how do you feel about that? Um, trying to ask those open-ended questions because ultimately I think folks are understanding and I think the pandemic kind of really gave us that, that moment to just kind of sit down and go, hey, what are we actually doing here? Um, and how is this working? And understanding how I'll land the plane here is um, understanding that, unfortunately, um, a lot of people didn't come back. When all of this shut down, when we were on a, you know, the break and such, 
um, a lot of people just didn't come back. And how I tend to articulate it to folks when talking about this is I tend to say, you can't ask people to find their joy in the same place that they lost it. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, how exactly are we making sure that you aren't just inviting folks who, who have been historically excluded, whose identities have been marginalized in this country, individuals who rarely get to the center of the room, who have to live on the fringes of the room? How exactly are you setting up a room for them to be in, not for the sake of optics, just to invite them right. in, but you actually have something for them in that space? You know, it is the matter of just like not just inviting the bodies into the room, but allowing them to uh, cultivating a space that allows them to bring their full self into the room. And so those are the conversations that I'm having like across these industries right now. And thank you for that. That's uh, really insightful. Um, and we are seeing an industry that is embracing intimacy work in a huge way, right? The fact that so many other industries are looking at this work and saying, hey, maybe there's something for us in here too, I think is really powerful. Um, Sarah, I'm going to throw this one to you next, thinking about uh, the folks that are looking to embrace intimacy work and folks who, thank you. <laughs> is this? Oh, look at that. Thank you so much. Let's have a, a, a applause. Thank you. For the Yes, I think the rest of them are fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, but, so I want to throw this to you as far as folks who are looking to embrace intimacy work and are looking to find a match um, for as an intimacy professional. Um, how do you recommend searching for an intimacy professional that's going to be the best fit for the production? Yeah, that's great. So uh, everyone has really different styles intimacy directors, intimacy coordinators, we all have very different styles, we all have very different energy. And so when you are looking to hire someone, please interview more than one of us. Um, <laughs> please do, and, and in fact, we, we will probably tell you who else to interview. Um, you know, there, there have been times where I've interviewed for a project and I've been like, you know what, this isn't my story to tell. Or, you know what, I actually think that someone else would be better for this. So, you know, it's really, you know, first of all, I think it's important, you know, finding, you know, go on the IDC website, go on the TIE website, you know, find people who, um, you know, have been trained in this discipline, who have experience, who have hours on set, who have things on their resume that, uh, you know, proves that they have, you know, worked not just in sort of a, you know, laboratory setting, but really have had to deal with, you know, be in the trenches on the ground and dealing with all of the nuances of, of the job. So once you find someone out of there, also word of mouth. If there's a theater that you're like, ooh, they did Venus and Fur, I wonder who their intimacy director was, you can find it on their website, you know, find the program. Give them, a, give them an email, find, you know, get, get in touch with them. Most of my jobs in, in TV in the last two years have been through word of mouth, which is wa wonderful. <laughs> um, but, you know, you also you know, have, have a resume that you can, that you can look at, you know, when, you, when you're hiring somebody. And when you interview, ask, you know, how do you work? You know, how, how are you going to collaborate with me? What, you know, what are, what are your goals for the scenes of intimacy in this, in this show? Do the, sh do the scenes that I flag match up with the scenes you flagged? Because you might have flagged 10 scenes, and you might have flagged two, you know? And so making sure that you're like, oh, that's a scene of intimacy? Hmm, they hold hands? I don't know if I need to work with this intimacy director. They seem a little for me, you know? And so, but that's legit, you know? And, and some people are like, oh yeah, fast and loose, you know? But it really is, so the, the, the three things we do, at least in TV, we advocate for actor safety, um, we uplift the vision of the director, and we provide uh, movement coaching when requested. Theater's a little bit different. Theater feels, for me, I tend to do a little bit more directing of scenes, um, kind of as a with a director's brain. But with coordinating, you know, the the, the biggest question, you know, when we talk to the to the to the you know the older generations who who we might have to kind of massage into the into the industry a little bit, I say, hey, you know what? One, not the touch police. 
Two, not here to tell you that you're wrong. And three, here's how I work, and if the way that you want to work is I stand behind the monitor and stay out of your way and give mints to the actors and make sure they feel safe, great. That's fine. If that's how you want to work, I can work that way. But you want to make sure that the person you're working with has similar vocabulary to you and uh, feels the same way about the show and is really passionate about the story, right? Like the context, why is the intimacy in the play? Um, and if those match up, like, red. Amazing. And uh, there's one last question that I'm going to ask all three of you before we jump into Q&A. So if you have a question, now is the time to, you know, synthesize it in your head. Um, in, you know, just a few words, when you look into the future five years from now, where do you hope this industry is? I mean, let's, I'm going to put you under the bus first, but what, where do you want to see this industry grow? So we need small changes incrementally over time that are sustainable, that are repeatable, that take care of the people doing them yes. because being part of the change sometimes hurts. Yeah. So when I think about seeing the future of intimacy, I wanna see more trained intimacy professionals working. I wanna see people in the industry also reflect the people, uh, the demographics of the country or region they are working in. I want to see more folks knowing the language to use when they don't have an intimacy coordinator or director on set or behind the scenes because I want that consent forward driven language to be used even when we are not around. Though that language applies in scenes that don't have intimacy too. That language applies to your working environment just as much. So really it's the end of rape culture and yeah. the end of the patriarchy that I would like to see. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll talk to you, Sarah, next, and Greg, I'll give you last word. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, e echoing all of that, but I, I think that just, just, I love giving the elevator speech of what I do, but I would also love to walk into a room and people already know what my job is. <laughs> I, I would love that, you know? I Like, I love the elevator speech. I love to, you know, I love educating people on what this is, but I, I would love even more that when someone calls me, they are so excited because I they know that 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 I or their, a fellow intimacy professional is there to make their show, whatever show, um, just that much more sparkly. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's where I hope the industry goes. In addition to all of those things, um, but you know, just just really, um, and that it's accessible. And something that's really hard right now that I'm finding is uh, people are finally, finally, not even like maybe half seas finally, but starting to uh, put the budget line for an intimacy coordinator or intimacy director, right? I actually had a director who. Uh, took out her set budget to hire an intimacy director mm. because it was that important to her to have an intimacy director on the show. So I didn't ask her to do that, but I would love if the education around, hey, if you're, if you're gonna do uh, uh, Vinegar Tom, you need to have a budget line for an intimacy professional. And so I hope that that is something that people understand as well. Amazing. Thank you. Greg? It would stop them from hiring you two weeks. Well, during tech. It would during probably tech. stop, yeah, it would, it would stop them from doing that, yes. We need you. It's happening tomorrow. It's happening. It happens so much. When's the show happening? <laughs> yesterday. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, we have a problem yesterday. Two things. Um, one, okay. One, I there's a fear that I have specifically with this industry and how I'm looking at it right now. Um, and it's from the conversation that I've been having or um, I've been privy to, because um, I'm specifically working with young people. I, I am fearful of two things. One, the, the thing that seems to be stopping this, I think, from moving forward um, is this is, tends to be looked at as care work, which is codified language for women's work. Mm. And so the, I find that a lot of the resistance that I'm not met with, I will be very clear about that, I understand my privilege in that, um, a lot of the resistance is from that, this idea of, and I think this is why we thought of like an HR department or something like that, it's like, oh, you're here to make sure that everyone's taken care of. And it's like, no, that's actually the job of everybody here. Consent is everybody's responsibility. 
Um, yeah. And so what I would love to see, um, and this is the analogy that I've been using, I'm really excited about. I, I would hope that this work does not become or go in the way of yoga. Oh. Say more. By this I mean, <laughs> This is a wellness practice and specifically talking about the culture and sustainability of people. I think unfortunately many people focus on the aesthetic of it all, what the poses look like, what this looks, what this makes me look like, i.e. what is the choreography. But something, a very smart thing that um, one of my mentors, Laura Reichert, said to me, she goes, the choreography is the easy part. And I went, what? She goes, the consent, boundaries, creating a deloaded, desexualized space. That is the thing that takes time. That is how you cultivate that trust. That determines the pace in which we move. And if very much, if you create a space in which individuals feel, that, feel like they have agency, very much like a trapeze artist, will be more willing to take risks if they understand that there's a net that's going to catch them. We just create that net. So how can we make sure that we understand that this is a full practice and not just something really pretty that looks aesthetically shiny at the end of the day? That's one. And then two, and finally, is I want to see more people who look like me. I just want to highlight the fact that like, still till now, I've been doing, I mean, my background is in sexual assault prevention education. Um, but I have been doing this work, like, like legitimately, I can call myself comfortably an intimacy person for the last year. Um, and during that year, I have worked on 52 productions in a year's time. This is to me saying that there is something that I possess that folks are really wanting into the room. Because the first thing that was said to me when I walked into a room, the very first room that I was in, I was uh, uh, assisting Chelsea Pace on White Noise in DC. In DC, Tati and Tatiana Williams, I will never forget this. I walked into the room and she goes, we get you, brother? Like, those were her words to me. And I still, I'm really excited because there's a Global Majority Intimacy Conference uh, that, um, that's about to go on. And I'm really hoping that I see other black men there because the only other intimacy folks that I've met, that I've met have been, uh, have not been, I have not met any other cis head black men doing this work. Um, but I think what the documentary uh, highlights is so, and, I, and I met this when I was doing my sexual assault prevention work. It's like, I understand why it is difficult to enter into the conversation around safety when historically you are not the face of safety. Mm. And also, if you are being told that you are the problem as a man, then you're just like, why am I going to enter the room when everyone's going to say, I'm going to walk into the room and it's unsafe. It's like, you have to historically understand why, though. Mm. It's because of what you've been allowed to do. So let's have a conversation, not necessarily about like, we take power from one person and give it to another. An, a, another. Like, it's like, how can we create a room in which we all can navigate in that way? Um, so I'm hoping that more people who look like me enter into this conversation because unfortunately I just, I haven't met any others that look like me. So I'm hoping that that changes in the next five years. Mm. Thank you, thank you. before we close out our panel. Um, I'm gonna just bring the microphone to you so you get to ask your own questions. Uh, if you wanna raise your hand, perfect, I see one, here we go. So you guys mentioned accessibility and then I don't know if you guys were able to see the premiere, but uh, they also talked about disability and stuff and this is a fairly new um, part uh, of the film industry. So I wanted to ask um, for, as a disabled person myself, um, is is intimacy coordination accessible for somebody who is physically and or mentally disabled? Thank you. That's a great question. Does anyone want to take that one? Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. To to be an intimacy director coordinator or yes. to participate? To, great. I think well. One, we have a general disability rights issue in this country. Um, and I think this pandemic has made it very, very clear what accommodations we can actually give that we were not willing to give before. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, I think there is the reality of like a film set being a grueling environment because you might be there for 12 hours a day. It is also true that as an intimacy coordinator, you might be there for two hours mm -hmm. and go home. 
there are accommodations you can ask of set in this is the benefit of a studio system it will have an hr that is more perhaps equipped to handle accessibility questions but i think absolutely you can bring that i know folks who have chronic disabilities who are intimacy coordinators and intimacy directors they they do things like bring chairs on set or tell people ahead of time and let folks know um I don't think it should be a barrier to entry. It is something to be aware of, like we go into any job or any project, to know what our limitations and what our needs are and to name them and don't be afraid to name them. Thank you for that. Um, who, do, you, do, you want, do you want to ask your question? Oh, I could. Okay. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, can you um, tell people uh, if they were interested in doing this kind of work, like where do you learn how to do it or what sort of background do you need or, um, or how did you yourself get into this? Um, yeah. Yeah, someone wants to share, uh, what, was, what, what inspired you to start intimacy work? There is no one way. That is the first thing out the There is no, oh, now it's me. <laughs> No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, we might have lost the whole thing. Yeah, yeah you did. You we are all audio. performers. We are yeah, yes. um, <laughs> um, I will say um, specifically, if you are looking to be an intimacy professional, uh, the primary thing to focus on is what. Now it's making up. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Um, if you're looking to be an intimacy professional, the primary thing to focus on is um, one. What is it that you're interested in the work about? I think this kind of goes back to my yoga point. It's just like, what are you specifically there for? Um, because it is, it is a. Uh, sorry, I'm just this feedback is. I'm, I'm gonna put this down. I'm sorry. Um, one, being clear about what you're going into the work for. Are you somebody who's just like I like? Because I do like I do a lot more. I, I do intimacy consulting work. I do intimacy choreography work. It's like, what specifically are you interested in, and who are you trying to? Um, where are you trying to do like this work in particular? Because it is very self, uh, it is very selfless work. It is like the idea of focusing on others um, and making sure for me, I think that's so, what's so important. It's like you have a way to replenish yourself being that you are going to be asked, uh, a lot is going to be asked from you from other people. How exactly do you create that sustainability for yourself in order to create a healthy, uh, a healthy way of working for yourself? Um, the very technical and practical of it all is uh, figure out what is your process. That's ultimately what you're seeking. It's just like, what is your process? Because uh, just because somebody's worked on like 50 shows and somebody's only worked on two shows doesn't mean the person who's worked on 50 shows is better than the person who's worked on two shows. Because the person who's worked on two shows may understand fully what their process is and be able to articulate it to understand whether or not they can meet the needs of that production. So it is, I think, seeking training, you know, the TIEs, the IDCs, and everything like that. But ultimately, what you're, I think what you're seeking to do is, what is your process? What do you understand this thing to be? And then how exactly can you make sure to, make, uh, to do that in a repeatable and sustainable way for yourself? Yeah, I would also say that uh, in, in addition to the, you, classes are very, very helpful, and I think very important. Um, one weekend workshop does not make someone an intimacy coordinator or an intimacy director. And that's one of the things I think that we're fighting against a little bit. Eh, fighting is a strong word, but fighting against a little bit is, you know, we want to make sure that uh, while we are not gatekeeping the industry, we also want to make sure that the people who are working, it it is a safety position and we don't want to do more harm than good, right? And so finding those classes, making sure that you're finding classes in um, anti-racism training, conflict resolution, um, gender identity, sensitivity classes, you know, all of these things that you're gonna have to bring to a, a set or a theater to make sure that, that you are sort of the voice of, of, of bringing that safety into the room, also really important. The other thing that uh, is something that I do just for fun is I find scenes in movies and TV that I think are really great intimacy scenes and I speak out loud what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Because that helps me to get in my mind the choreography. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, his hand goes on her right shoulder. Her pelvis presses against his left hip because that's the wording we are using me. That's the wording I am using on set. I'm not saying make it more raunchy. I'm saying lift your ribs, throw your head back and take a nice long sigh because that's what you can do. What does raunchy mean? It doesn't mean anything. It means something else to everybody else. So find, find ways of practicing that very, very technical vocabulary, um, which is really helpful once you get into a room. I also want to offer that intimacy is a growing field, and I, I assume that all of us are doing continuing education and additional workshops with a number of organizations, NSIP, IDC, TIE, IPA, Many of them are online and accessible as well. Um, and there's, in, I, I strongly agree that one weekend um, or one conversation with an intimacy professional does not mean you should go calling yourself an intimacy professional. Um, it does take training because of the inherent power that you hold as an intimacy professional in the space. There is a, an expectation of some level of awareness of trauma-informed training, of mental health first aid, of a number of other topics that both Sarah and Greg have brought up. Um, but yeah, I, I'm still learning how to do this stuff all the time. Or I hop onto a Slack that I'm in with other intimacy professionals where I'm like, um, this thing is happening and like, I don't really know how this is gonna work. And they'll be like, this is the thing I tried. Or all of us will be like, none of us have done that. <laughs> Let us brainstorm. Um, the beauty of getting into it now is we're also learning together and creating the way we want to make this industry work together. And I think Greg made a great point about figuring out your own process. You have to know how you hold space and how you talk and communicate so you can understand how other people need to be communicated to. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. I'm gonna uh, really, really quickly add on to uh, add on, uh, adding on to that, breathe, Greg. Um, <laughs> adding on to that, um, <laughs> practice, same practice. Um, a question that I tend to ask uh, my students in particular is, um, where are you practicing intimacy before you get into the room? Mm -hmm. In other words, if you are supposed to be bringing tools of communication to make sure that folks can navigate discomfort and everything, how are, and you're supposed to essentially be building uh, physical relationships, how are you modeling and, and navigating that in your life before you get into the work, into the room, so it doesn't feel foreign to you when this is the thing that you're being asked to do? So look at like, how are you building consent with people you don't know? How does consent look like with people that you do know? What are, like, how exactly are you going about understanding what this is? So when you're in front of folks and they're like, you have 20 minutes to choreograph three kisses. This has literally been said to me. <laughs> um, and you're going, cool, I know how to shorthand and communicate that because I have practice with this. And so the folks in the room aren't sitting there waiting and watching me go, I don't know how to talk about this. I mean, I know what it is, but I don't know. Where are you practicing? Everyday life gives us an, an opportunity to interact with folks. So get into the practice of doing that. So then it translates when you're, you know, doing the job or um, in those spaces. Amazing. Um, folks, we are at uh, 5 p.m. I know it is um, heartbreaking, um, but uh, that, those last bits of information, no, no hiding faces, no hiding faces. <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to make sure we wrap this up on time. Those last bits of information were incredibly um, uh, nuanced and deeply personal. And I just want to thank you all for bringing your experience, your process, your practices into this space. We have dug into the definitions of intimacy, how it's functioning from TV, film, theater, opera, fashion, looking at small sets to big sets and talking about what it means to bring entertainment into a new era of consent-based practices. So thank you all for being here and supporting this work. And thank you so much, Greg, Sarah, and Amy, for everything you do here in Chicago. Thank you so much. And with that, we close out our panel. <laughs>